so good evening everyone and i hope everyone is well and safe uh, today's uh, webinar we have a very special invitee with us guest speaker uh, he has been a leader in the executive management role with companies like infosys mindtree and wipro a widely traveled person and he has played multiple roles in the entire it services so most of us who are from the it services we, he he can relate to with uh, very well with us he himself is a apmp uh, practitioner certified practitioner so he knows the cycle side of uh, this side of the business as well as he has been a sales uh, leader and he has been coaching mentoring uh, many people in sales and his his company now is a, as a consulting company he now coaches uh, mentors as well as trains people on sales in a different sales aspects from right from sales pitching to sales uh, professional skills capability skills within organizations so it, uh, his uh, his book games people customers play is uh, one of the best sellers and very referred book of not only for sales but also for the delivery people it's all about the relationship and what all depends on the relationship uh, between the customer and the vendor and how things shape up depending on the uh, relationships which you have and even and he has a very scientific way of approaching the relationship which gives you a capability not only to assess where your relationship stands but also what actions you need to take and what actions you need to take at which uh, level uh, of your relationship or which quadrant of your relationship you need to take so that's all, all i have to say about ramesh and uh, over to you ramesh Thank you, Abhijit. Uh, uh, I hope uh, everyone is able to hear me. Uh, if you're not able to hear me, just uh, ping me. Uh, I do have a tendency to, for my voice to just go down a little bit uh, as time goes by. So if you think that you can't hear me, please uh, give me a shout. Uh, uh, just to you know, start off with, this was a concept that was there in Daniel Goldman's book called Social Intelligence. Now, Daniel Goldman's uh, book on emotional intelligence is something that most of you would have heard of or read, but he also had a relatively lesser known book called Social Intelligence, which talks about how, you know, socially we interact with each other. And it says that we either view another person as a you or an it, in the sense that, uh, you know, you really don't know the name of the person who uh, pushes the vegetable cart on your roads, selling some tomatoes and uh, potatoes. I mean, very few of us know about that person's name or whatever, and they also don't know about us. At the same time, there are people who you know very well and they also know you very well and they treat you as a person and you treat them as a person. Uh, Daniel Goldman says that uh, troubles start appearing when people expect to be treated in one way and are not treated in that manner. And so I was looking at this and he had drawn it in a straight line and said one end is it and the other end is you. And given our IT uh, you know, uh, desire to make everything a two by two matrix, I thought, can I make this a two by two matrix? And look at one side where how the buyer treats or views the seller as between it and you and how the seller treats or views the buyer also as a continuum of it and you, and therefore, ergo, you get uh, you know four quadrants, uh, which all of you are familiar with, would have seen, in fact, would have gotten sick about in some time uh, at some point in your career. You really look at it, there are four quadrants then, which are the transactional quadrant, the personal quadrant, the buyer tyranny quadrant, and the seller tyranny quadrant. Now, the transactional quadrant is the one where both the seller and the viewer and the buyer 
the vendor as well as the buyer customer treat each other as an it. Uh, simple example is the bus conductor. You don't know his name, he doesn't know your name. It's the transaction that happens. In fact, a number of transactions in your life would belong to this quadrant because otherwise it'd be too exhausting. So the next one is the personal quadrant where you need to know the seller well and the seller needs to know the buyer well. Both, it has to happen in both sides that they know each other well. Uh, for example, a, a, a doctor, uh, you just accept in, in the case of an emergency, you just go and, go and go to a stranger who doesn't know your case history, especially as you get older. Um, a coach, a therapist, a, you know, a mentor. So multiple a consultant, uh, multiple relationships where both of you need to know each, some aspect of each other and treat each other as a person and not as a, an object. So that is the personal quadrant. The focus is on the specifics. Uh, what is this person's qualification? Uh, how good is he in treating children? For example, if it's your if it's your pediatrician for your children. So all of that. So you focus on the specifics. Trouble happens when there is no symmetry. That is, one party treats the other party as an object, whereas the other party has to treat them as a person. For example. Uh, this is the example where of United, uh, United Airlines, which is famous for putting hospital in hospitality uh, by kick, dragging and kicking a passenger just to accommodate their own staff to fly. So that's because and that in that position, at that moment in time, they had the complete power over the person. And so they could act like a tyrant and you know, treat the customer as, uh, as, uh, as nearly as an object to be thrown away. The other side of the coin is where people are treated as resources. Uh, you know, how many people do you need to build, a, who know you need to dig a well uh, or paint a wall. Uh, you can see people, and this is a scene that is played out nearly in every city in India where laborers stand on one side of the road and lorries uh, or tractors with uh, you know uh, huge uh, trailers come and people get on board and then go and it's it's a daily wage uh, labor and these people are treated like objects and not as people whereas they have to be giving the utmost respect and the utmost uh, reverence, nearly uh, reverence uh, to the person who is giving them the business. So that is buyer tyranny because there is an oversupply. The margins are diminishing, but still uh, because of the oversupply and there is no other alternate, they have to work that way. Uh, some echoes may be there. You might be uh, thinking of your own certain relationships with customers that perhaps fall in this quadrant. I'll stop here for some questions, if there are any. Hello. Uh, Ramesh, we can have the questions at the end of the session. Uh, oh. We already have a set of questions which we have shared with you. Yeah, yeah, that, that's fine. But based on this, if there are any questions or if there's anything that they don't understand or something. So. Okay. okay, I'll move on. Yeah. So this is, the this is the basic framework that I call the E model, which is nothing but U, it as the first two letters and therefore the trick is to understand where are you in relationship with your customers within this quadrant are you a lot of us think that you know we are very strategic consultants a um, lot of uh, thing is given to us but are you seriously there 
or is it a transactional uh, relationship, but with a little bit of a human touch because of the culture involved? So these are questions that you need to ask because the basic problem arises for a business when they think they are trying to be more than what the market or the customer wants them to be. Uh, you end up being, you end up wasting money and you end up wasting effort. Uh, let me give you an example. Of course, now we can't go out anyway, but if you go to, I hope most of you are from India and you understand the local vegetarian uh, breakfast shops that are there or even lunch shops where you go and get a filter coffee for 10 rupees or 20 rupees, where it depends on where you are. Uh, imagine that you go and you sit and you order for the filter coffee, which is 20 rupees, and out comes this, you know, liveried waiter, uh, white, full white dress with a head, traditional head cap, golden buttons, clean, starched. Uh, guy is well dressed. Everything is good about him. And he's carrying a huge silver tray with a cup, uh, you know, fine china cup, uh, a decanter, a, some cream, a coffee pot, some cookies, and then comes and says, here is the filter coffee you ordered. Obviously, your reaction is going to be, your first reaction is going to be, I didn't order for this. I ordered for a 20 rupee uh, filter coffee that I get in one small stainless steel uh, tumbler. Uh, so what is this? And if you say, are you sure this is the one in the menu and you point it out and the money is there and the price is written there as 20 rupees. And the guy says, yes. Then your reaction is, okay, I'll have it as long as I'm paying only that much. That's what happens when as service providers, as sellers, we tend to do what is called this value add and try to load everything without charging for it. Initially, they, will, they might say, what is the expense? Uh, am I, uh, where am I paying for all this? And once that bridge is crossed, they will just take advantage. And the problem there is that once you get into that habit, withdrawing that special extras becomes very difficult. And therefore, you end up start losing money. So this is one example of behavior where, uh, you know, you think you're in the personal quadrant, you're very strategic to the customer, both of you treat each other very well, and it's, uh, you know, you know them, they know you and all that. But actually what you're providing is a transactional service, and all they're doing is taking advantage of you. So that is why it becomes very important to understand where you are in the quadrant with regard to a customer. Now, again, uh, not all projects with a single customer will fall only in one side of the quadrant. Not all of your customers will be in one quadrant. So there is a spread, but look at it from a trend perspective, from the, a directional perspective, not from exact positioning of where you are or trying to take an average and saying, okay, some of them are in bioterrainy, some of them are in personal, some of them are in transactional and therefore I can put it somewhere in the middle. That's not the way to look at this model. So, how do you find out which quadrant you are? Um, obviously, there is a little Excel tool that I have, uh, which I use when doing my consulting uh, things. But and, and in the book also, there's far more written about um, how do you figure that out. But a, a few of the important things, one is the need to exchange sensitive information. Are you exchanging sensitive information? Is your customer giving you his budget, next year's IT budget, or next year's sales budget, or whatever it is, and saying, this is where my pro problem is, this is where I want your help, 
these are my challenges. So is he saying that or is he just throwing RFPs across the wall? Uh, same way, are they interested in your strategic direction? Do I mean, do you share sensitive information with them in terms of what new services you are adopting, new services you can you know try, uh, places where you've not done very well but you want to improve and you know, the, the conversation itself is at a completely different level. Second one is the interdependency. Are you interdependent on each other? What will happen to your customer if tomorrow they stop getting your services? Will they go under? Will they survive? Will they have a little bit of difficulty till they find another vendor? Or will they not even know that you have changed? Where are you there? A third is the level of customization that needs to be done. Uh, customization of uh, your own, uh, how much is the customization needed to make a product work for the customer? Um, examples are like these uh, power plants that you built uh, for say an aluminum company. It, it has to be absolutely customized. So stuff like that. And the fourth is, fourth important internal factor that we call is buyer familiarity. How familiar are, is the buyer with you? And how familiar are you with the buyer? Um, too much familiarity is dangerous, but do you have a, a certain level of familiarity with each other's processes so that you can both speak something and understand the same thing? Uh, so that these are the factors that will help you in, internally to see how good is your, where, which quadrant you're in. External factors, the most important one is what we call as the, uh, uh, as the interaction pattern. Obviously, social factors, environment, uh, the context in which you're delivering the service, and the endowment effect. Where, you know, endowment effect uh, is about <clears throat> if a customer already has something, uh, they value it. If a person has something, they own something, they value it more than what is available in the market uh, because of sentimental value or because they're used to the product. There are multiple things. Uh, uh, read up about it. it. That becomes a factor in trying to say which quadrant you are in, in, in terms of, you know, for instance, uh, uh, in Wipro, uh, if you enter the main building on the Electronic City campus and you go down to the basement, in the corner there is one uh, snack shop. Now that person has been there in that place, running that shop from seven o'clock in the morning till 10 o'clock at night or something like that, every day for the last, since, I mean, 15 years or something, since that uh, st store was set up, that the campus was set up and the store was uh, operational, he's been there. Now, people don't want to replace him. Uh, everybody knows him. Uh, and that and that sense of ownership means that he has a relationship which is not that of a typical corner shop relationship. So that's that's what a Norman effect is. I will just go deeper into one of the factors, which is the interaction pattern. And this is a little bit technical, uh, and it's uh, science back. But I assume that I'm mostly speaking with. Uh, people with engineering and science backgrounds. So this should not be too difficult for them. <clears throat> you really look at it when human beings interact with each other, uh, either as groups interacting with different groups or a person interacting with another person. There are four ways in which they interact. And these have been four components of the interaction between the two. Uh, one of them is called authority ranking. As the name suggests, you bow to a higher authority and because of position, you treat them with respect <clears throat> and that person need not treat you with the equal respect. 
that that is the difference in the authority ranking um, typical feudal structures the zamindari system um, and, and all of them uh, fall under that system of uh, authority ranking the other one is what is called market pricing so the ranking is based the the relationship is based on an exchange of a product or a service purely on what the market values it at and so you know i i sweep the i i shovel the snow off uh, as a teenager i shovel the snow off a driveway in the us uh, i get three dollars so that's the market price and that's what is being paid and nothing else to it the third one is called equality mapping equality mapping mapping is very simple i scratch your back you scratch my back what adam grant talks about as matchers uh, that's that's the predominant way in which people operate reciprocity is a powerful human emotion and that again comes in the fourth interaction pattern is actually communal sharing and that's the highest form of sharing because that's like a family uh, the unit of family the unit of community even now in certain uh, ancient uh, you know tribes uh, that live in uh, in in the indonesian micronesian polynesian uh, archipelagos uh, the tribes that live in central india uh, the tribes are the red indian tribes so all of them have this communal sharing in fact one of the red indian tribes actually every 5 years or 6 years the the most wealthy person in the tribe calls everybody in the tribe and then distributes everything away uh, what he has and that that completely goes into sharing communally uh, there it's not about who paid how much who contributed how much but it's about understanding different people doing uh, their own bits and sharing for a greater common good the surprising thing that anthropologists sociologists and psychologists have uh, found out through years and years of research is that these are the only four ways in which human beings transact with each other uh, there may be combination of one or two of them in a particular interaction but all human uh, interactions have only these four attributes and therefore if you really look at it when you look at buyer tyranny and seller tyranny you're actually looking at authority ranking and therefore you can <clears throat> you can be there are several books and journals available on how people in authority ranking behave uh, the worst being uh, the stanford prison experiment where normal 20 to 30 year olds who were equally divided into prisoners and jailers the jailers within 3 days started ill treating the prisoners even though they were play acting so that's the kind of thing that happens with human beings when they are put in positions of power and that is something that you need to understand <clears throat> that when people are in that kind of power how much of it do they exhibit so there are several experiments the one experiment that's the most famous one is the stanford prison experiment uh, market pricing any transactional you know uh, thing will transactional quadrant interaction relationship buyer seller relationship will determine be determined on market pricing which is why you will have you know price discovery and all of those things happening there Uh, equality mapping is a strange one in the sense that it it straddles both the transactional and the personal quadrant but the personal quadrant is more genuinely characterized by communal sharing when you know both the the vendor and the buyer both feel that they are a single team competing against a different uh, uh, competitor in the same market so that is the kind of sharing that they do uh, ge used to do it ge chemicals is a fantastic example of uh, trying to 
get into that kind of a market where their their goal was to make their customers more profitable it was not about them being profitable so that was the goal they had mckinsey still has a goal about how they make the, uh, about customer satisfaction uh, a lot of the people in mckinsey are not ranked uh, rated on the revenue they make <clears throat> but by how the customer thinks that person is critical for their success so these are the kind of uh, uh, interaction patterns that are there between buyers and sellers and once you know this you will be able to understand what what really where are, where you are really in this in this whole quadrant and how therefore you must be behaving to to optimize the way you behave in a relationship and you interact in a relationship again another uh, little uh, segue into this is that most of you are in the get it part of the relationship uh, pre sales and sales tend to be in the get it part of the relationship uh, use it as typically delivery and fix it definitely delivery pre sales never gets involved and there is a customer escalation that's the one good thing about being in pre sales now i'm going to stop here because after that is it's about escaping and all of that but i'm going to stop here and ask whether this clarifies how how the proposal needs to be hello yes sir we can hear you yeah so i'm going to stop here and ask you all about you know how this can influence the level of effort the, the the kind of messaging that you need to do for different proposals yes it def definitely helps because first thing you know what is your pitch going to be because you understand is the customer only looking like if, if you are in a quadrant where the customer is only looking at you to supply some bodies as of a, as of a staff augmentation engagement there you definitely need not go and tell you about uh, all about your hiring processes and your quality processes you only need to tell them about what how are you going to give them the bodies they need yeah whereas whereas if you, if a customer comes to you and, uh, and and you see yourself in a quadrant in a relationship with the customer where the customer is sharing what their pains are what their aspirations are definitely you need to tell that how much you understand them how much you relate with them and how much are are you able to will you be able to deliver the value to them basically how do you align with their vision so definitely it helps to once you know in which quadrant you are your pitch your entire messaging comes out of it absolutely That's... any other points Uh, hi, Bharat. So I believe you know, depending on the quadrant that we are, it helps us understand what level of comfort that we have with customer, and we can articulate our messaging according to that. So, for example, if it's a transactional, uh, you know, approach, our messaging would be more straightforward, more uh, in align with with regards to the product or service we're proposing. That's why. But if we have some uh, personal relationship out with customer, we have that connect. We, we we might provide you know we might go beyond to a level to give it more personal touch we might you know make it according to their you know aspiration or according to their maybe even you know simple look and feel that they 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 go with so to make it more you know personal more aligned it depends on the uh, the level of interaction we have with them absolutely <clears throat> so how will you for instance so i'm just I, i'm trying to you know kind of trigger a few thoughts in you so how will you figure out that you know you are in the transactional quadrant and not in the buyer terrain quadrant and so, what is your proposal how will your 
for instance i hope everyone knows yet what team statements are and uh, all that so how will your team statements differ for these two uh, so for for my understanding it, it the major thing that would you know i would take in consideration is uh, is it like a, you know do we have a connect or sales or our sales team have a connect with client or this is just a random rfp that you know that come through a, a defined procurement process uh, second thing uh, how how strategic the client is is it like we are going in from a future say you know road map perspective or this is just like we have to sell it, uh, the product thing one time you know sell and then we'll look forward so depending on what kind of you know future road map we have for that client my strategy or messaging would also you know get impacted so and again as you said the win team the win team would you know teams would dep- be dependent again on couple of this point okay so that that is when uh, anybody else has a different view because i saw only abhijit and bharat talking but i don't know how many participants are there uh... we have 26 participants right now pardon me 26 26 okay so there are 24 others who are not talking guys you know we have to be a little interactive because otherwise this will become a one side bashan and uh... hello okay so moving on uh, uh just just to add a point i yes, think ma'am. many are like focusing and then people will raise their points at the end okay this is a usual practice we follow we don't okay. want to you know the presenter in between and then the thought process is lost okay so i i was just stopping at one one uh, you know logical place but anyway let me go ahead uh what are the yeah people? yeah yeah. So. yeah this is supriya so um rather than a point of view i think i have a question on various uh, buyer seller uh, irony and all the relationships of you in it okay. what i have generally seen is um, just recently i have moved from my pre sales role into sales and then um, when we have these um, customer engagements or customer visiting our organization and we have uh, a state of the art infrastructure at some of the locations here in india and what we tend to do is we tend to have a shop floor or you know have an organizational view of what we have built what are the facilities mm-hmm. and you know suppose if i'm working in the infrastructure managed services space so i'll show them all the single pane of glass views and you know how our facilities are structured and all of that so here i'm trying to build a strategic relationship say with my customer but um, sometimes or uh, um, often i have seen that people who are in a very transactional play they just try to restrict their conversations to the transactional side of things yeah. and then uh, they also worry sometimes that okay oh my god is this customer or is this uh, vendor not trying to bill me for the uh, you know extra big in services that they have built so yeah. i am just looking for a very tactical relationship here hmm. so this is i think uh, where are we with the customer or where are we with the buyer often comes out very clearly from the conversations that we are having so far but uh, uh, you know this is how we have seen that after a good show that has been put up not only from uh, a welcoming standpoint but from a technology standpoint but we see sometimes the customers refuse to come up with uh, you know the their side of things and we have not won business or we have lost that and then we trying to figure out or do a retrospective of where did we go wrong and uh, you know what actually uh, did not go well and where can we improve Mm-hmm. Uh, but then sometimes as you rightly mentioned the relationship uh, as in uh, we both as in the buyer and the seller are not at the same wavelengths yes. and uh, we are trying to expect something else from the buyer and the buyer is trying to expect something else from the seller and that is how both of uh, both of these people might be right at their view point or at their uh, scheme of things but mm-hmm. then since our wavelengths didn't match and since the relationship didn't crack absolutely i i do not know how many of you i you know a lot of you would have experienced this when you go to tourist spots uh you will have 
some people coming and crowding you, offering to be your guide and stuff like that. There'll be some who will be, uh, you know, really aloof. They'll be sitting in one corner, probably the government guides or whatever, who are getting anyway paid. So they'll be in one corner, they won't even be bothered. And there'll be this biomedia people who, who make their presence known, but they don't come and overly, you know, come on too strong onto you. And you end up going there. Uh, there are, you know, as humans, we tend to shrink away when somebody comes on very strongly. And in a way that we don't expect them to come on. Uh, you know, it's, it's called trying too hard. I still remember one sales guy telling me when I was in delivery, telling me when there's a customer visit happening, uh, Ramesh, tell your people not to sell. Right? So these are guys who are uh, sick. So ask your people not to be, uh, you know, uh, come and say, I want your business. We are very keen, all this. Let's not just present and get out of the room. Uh, tell your people that. So the reason is that he had understood from the customer that they're not uh, in for something where, you know, there's an over-friendly, over-eager. Uh, they tended to view it that way. Whereas that kind of reaction, some people would absolutely love it because they're being fond upon and they're being treated like royalty. They really love it. And uh, at the end of the day, emotions play, play a very large part in making that decision. So yes, completely agree with you that unless you kind of figure out, you know, every relationship, you can't make it strategic. Particularly when you're in the infrastructure services provider, uh, services play, space, because for a number of companies, infrastructure is something that needs to be there. It's it, even for the CIO, it, it's, it's not something that is, a, uh, uh, that is uh, the only target they have there is how, how many MIPS I get, how, many, how much of storage do I get for the lowest price and at what point of reliability. So they kind of, they, they've kind of reduced it to that. Whereas there are some and some people who look at infrastructure in a far more serious way, uh, far more critical way, and think of infrastructure as being one of their competitive differentiators, having a much better infrastructure as one of the competitive differentiators. There you need to go and uh, obviously pitch in a strategic way. Understanding the difference, clearly the kind of the size of the contract, the nature of the relationship, uh, the nature of the business that the customer is in, and to what extent they your services will be a help in the customer differentiating and becoming more competitive in the market. If you start thinking that way, then you'll be able to analyze the relationships. Uh, what really gets my goat is that the number of times we keep talking about how strategic we are to the customer and the customer is just laughing his guts out at the back. Because for them, you really, it really doesn't matter whether you're providing it, how you're providing it. All they're worried about is, can I get this at the cheapest rate possible? Does that make sense, Supriya? Yeah, absolutely, Ramesh. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So moving on, one of the typical questions they've asked is, you know, people have asked, is how do I escape buyer tyranny? How can I, uh, you know, avoid the cons consequences of the buyer having extraordinary amounts of power over me. Now, everybody thinks that's by becoming more strategic to the customer, but actually that's not the answer. The answer is actually to make it far easier for the customer to do transactions without, with you without knowing who you are. Can you ease the way they get the service? Can you ease the way they use the service? Can you ease the way they can you fix the service in a very, very simple manner? Uh, for instance, the example that I give is the ATM. 
the banking bank uh, automated telemachines. Uh, clearly, that completely elim eliminates the human interaction that is going to happen. Uh, most strategic books, books on strategic selling, etc., will tell you about human relationships and all that. But and therefore, you would have had to improve that experience to escape buyer tyranny. But the banks actually went ahead and sold the ATM concept. Today, you will not bank with a bank which says, I will not have ATMs. Right? Will you, will you agree to go and stand in a queue in front of a teller and get money? You won't. So that is one of the ways in which you can escape buyer tyranny in the sense, can you reduce human interactions, make it easier, automate all of that so that it becomes easier for them to transact and therefore you become, uh, it, it's more ease of uh, service or reliability or quality, something that is automated and made easier to procure and therefore you can escape buyer tyranny. Uh, the other ones are choosing a lesser market. I mean, uh, um, can you be, be a bigger fish in a smaller pond? For instance, uh, you know, some of the services that even IT services providers provide in the, in the developed markets uh, can be significantly uh, uh, more, uh, you know, in escaping the buyer tyranny if you choose a lesser market. For instance, uh, banks in Africa will consider an Indian IT service provider far more strategic than banks in, uh, uh, say, the US or Europe. So can you shift to a lesser market? And can you go to a different demographic? Uh, Cricket did it beautifully by uh, moving to IPN, which brought in the family and three hours of family time and stuff like that and youngsters, more youngsters who had time in the evenings to go and watch uh, rather than uh, stick with one day or, or even test cricket for that matter. Uh, the fourth thing is to drop the product or service. IBM did it brilliantly by dropping the PC and selling it off to Lenovo and focusing on services and high-end uh, segments, uh, product segments. Or you could fire the client you could just say, no, I can't service this client because uh, this client is just tyrannical. And, uh, Infosys walking out of G is, is a fantastic uh, example of that, where just because you're trying, you're servicing uh, a client who had a 30% uh, share of your business at that point in time, and therefore could really dictate a lot of terms, uh, but that was impacting the rest of the organization. So Mr. Muthi decided to fire the client. So these are some of the ways in which you can escape. But remember that escaping it, you cannot straight away move into the personal quadrant. It is by reducing interaction, ease of in, improving ease of interaction, reducing the opportunities for friction where the client can express some sort of power over you. Those are the ways in which you can escape this uh, tyranny, this buyer tyranny. And then you move to the personal quadrant. So how do you move to the personal quadrant? You know, how do I get closer to the customer? How do I become more, uh, how do I improve my relationship with the customer? Some examples that we can give here. One is what Asian Paints did. Asian Paints is a paint shop. I mean, uh, especially for the owner, uh, you know, it really didn't matter. Uh, so they will say, I want this color, I want this thing then. So the guy will say, distemper you want, emulsion you want, high class one you want, all those things and then they'll paint it. Whereas Asian Paints came and said, here is a bundled offering. We will come to you with the, and then take photos of your house and then show you the different colors so that the house looks, so that you know you get to have a sense of what the house will look like with new painting. 
and then you know you have this mixing of colors million colors can be mixed uh, ready made so all of that so the bundling of the services meant that you started looking at the person who came the asian paints rep who came as far more of your friend and consultant and you probably know his name and you probably have him on speed dial at least for the time till the painting job is done another way of doing it was what ikea does it beautifully uh, it provides a sense of accomplishment because you finally assemble the furniture and that gives you it's 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 a strange uh, thing about human nature uh, there is there are papers written about it that you can uh, search on google scholar most of them are free uh, by making you do a set the finishing bits of the assembly ikea actually makes you feel grateful for them grateful towards them and therefore uh, it improves the relationship the third one is about how do you hide complexity caterpillar does it beautifully uh, they have these all these uh, uh, internet of things iot sensors on their machines and therefore they don't you don't have to worry about when that machine has to be serviced the earth mover has to be serviced etc or even sharing a common cause uh, for example starbucks is famous for its ethical purchases non conflict zone purchases non child labor purchases uh, keeping their employees giving them healthcare dental as well as education opportunities for education so all of this tend to provide a sense of a common cause and these are ways in which and so people have a much more uh, personal relationship with that brand and so these are some of the ways that you can move to the personal garden obviously all this will not happen overnight it has to happen over a period of time and how do you watch out for signs of you know the client actually taking you for granted poor payment contract uh, poor very poor payment records they'll say 60 days but they'll take four and a half months five months uh, i've had one client like that so i've had to in fact when they asked me to do something i said no i don't want to work with you anymore i fired the client <clears throat> the second one is in the middle of the contract for instance there was this oil major who had just done a vendor con consolidation uh, and uh, reduced the number of vendors to four and therefore they said from about seven or eight therefore they said we are nearly doubling your uh, revenues and therefore uh, uh, give us a, a good discount etc they negotiated hard and everybody gave the discounts and uh, but all of them had this contract clause that this is a contract that needs to go for 5 years now what happened was they in one year's time they came back and said to all the four vendors we need to renegotiate the contract and by the way and because we are bidding out the entire work again and by the way all your contracts have this uh, penalty clause for uh, termination without cause you need to give us a formal letter saying that you're waiving that clause if you want to receive the bid again now this is a fairly large com oil major a significant portion of the revenue for the, of the, at least for the utilities vertical comes from that uh, place So there is no way a ceo is going to say no i am not going to bid again for it i am not going to waive the contract clause so they knew that they can get away with that kind of behavior and that's another example for uh, buyer tyranny third one is about cross scale competition when what you do can be done by a little shop down the road Uh, rude behavior, frequent cancellations of meetings, uh, extensively long beauty contests uh, to to select a vendor. All of these indicate uh, a sense, uh, some signs of power asymmetry, which then you can try to negate over the longer period uh, by 
doing some stuff that is different from the competition. And just to leave you with the last one, the average is not your friend. Now, this is a very interesting picture because all of these are Indian pilots. If this had been a picture that had taken 20 years ago, all of them would have been of almost the same height, probably one inch taller or short. The tolerance was about one inch or one and a half inches till then. It is only now that pilots who are slightly taller, like the one on the extreme left of the picture and also the second from right, uh, even get to fly planes. Uh, the reason is that aircrafts were designed in such a way that they took earlier, that they took the average measurements of what a pilot should be and then designed the cockpit for that. And they found that most pilots do not fit the average measurement. Uh, and because of that, the reaction time of pilots while landing, especially in tough weather, while or, or even, even otherwise, because of uh, them not being of the average uh, body dimensions, except for the height, uh, were creating accidents. Uh, they were pulling the wrong levers. They were... <laughs> Uh, they were not doing things in time because the design of the instruments was in such a way that they couldn't see it properly. A lot of things that went wrong till finally they realized that instead of doing it for the average, you actually have to design for a range of body dimensions. And when they started doing that, they found that a person who was having longer legs, if you have to design for that anyway, you might as well design in a way that he also is a taller person. So th that is why you see now pilots uh, who can nearly be six feet, six, six feet uh, also, instead of that uh, standard, I think, Don Bradman height or Sachin Tendulkar height, which was the standard for pilot, at least Air Force pilots for a very long time. Now, why am I spending so much time on this story? Is because even when it comes to customers, the average is not your friend. Two extreme relationships cannot be averaged out and saying, okay, they are fine. It is about understanding how different stakeholders view you, how different stakeholders uh, who are evaluating your bids will view you in terms of specific language and then trying to fine tune your bids and proposals and also the relationships, evaluate your relationships accordingly. Uh, can I play a little video? Will it come on everybody's audio? Yeah, yes. It will. Okay. So this is a video about when expectations mismatch. Uh, see this and then we can talk about it. Let me just pop it in the box. There. Look, could we be quite quick? Certainly, so. Ready in the flashes, the flashes. Yeah, it's great. Not quite finished. Look, actually, I don't, I don't need it. I just put it in my pocket. No, this isn't a bag, sir. Really? This is so much more than a bag. Quite quick. Grandissimo. What's that? It's a cinnamon stick, sir. Actually, I really I can't wait. Oh, you won't regret it, sir. What about? Is but the work of a moment. Yeah, almost finished. 
Almost finished. What else can that be? You're going to dip it in yogurt, cover it with chocolate buttons. Oh, yes. I'm going to pop it in the Christmas box. But I don't want a Christmas box. But you said you wanted a gift wrap. I did. <laughs> this is the final flourish. Can I just pay? No. Oh, God, is this sprinkle? No, 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 no bloody hole. Let's say nothing. Leave it, leave it. Just leave it. Looking around the jewelry section, I see. No, I was just looking. Okay, so I hope all of you saw the video. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Really. So you understand? This guy was in a hurry because he wanted to buy this for his girlfriend before his wife comes. Whereas he was taking our man, Mr. Bean, was taking all of his time to. Uh, value add without understanding what was the most important thing which is to uh, for him to just get it as fast as possible and so this tends to happen in bias seller relationships because we tend to have a process or a procedure which will say these are the steps you have to follow this is how you need to deliver whereas sometimes the client is not looking for all of it he is just looking for a shortcut he's looking for a solution that will work for him at that time. So <clears throat> understanding the market, understanding your customer's uh, place in the market, understanding your relationship with the customer and how they view you. And that view is not because, uh, you know, uh, they have something wrong about you, they want to exploit or anything. That's, that's the way the nature of the game is. And therefore, what you can do to improve your position becomes all the more important. And I hope that with this exposure to this uh, idea, uh, you're able to better position yourselves in your proposals uh, based on these uh, principles that are there. Uh, Abhijit, do you want to add anything before we take questions? Uh, no, not really. I think uh, it's a really uh, very insightful uh, way of looking at it. And there is a lot of uh, retrospection we need to do. Exactly looking at Mr. Bean that how many times do we really keep on writing our executive summaries, our value propositions, overloading everything, whereas they simply want a yes or no answer. Yep. Yeah, we're all guilty of that because they say, um, this is the only way to differentiate in front of the customer. Exactly. So I'm open to all the questions now. So we can start off with the questions you had given, uh, Abhijit. Yeah, I, can go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, I had one question. Uh, so like you explained those portraits really well. First thing I, I would like to say, I mean, that really gives us some perspective. Now, I wanted to understand from your point of view is what would be our aspiring quadrant, like what we should target towards. Because from my, what I've seen and what I've understood so far, I feel, uh, you know, uh, being in either of the transactional or personal quadrant would, would land us into trouble. I think the sweet, sweet spot would be in between the transactional and personal. But do you, what I wanted to understand if my understanding is correct or do you think yeah. we should aspire to go to us personally yeah. altogether? Yeah, the thing is that uh, uh, what successful organizations have done <clears throat> is uh, very clearly have services that belong to a particular quadrant uh, and avoid the buyer tyranny quadrant. Seller tyranny, let's not talk about it itself because that's for monopolies and all. And as a buyer, how you behave with that is what I talk about in the book as a customer. But otherwise, uh, as long as you're not in the buyer tyranny quadrant, you're okay. Because there is fortune at the bottom of the pyramid. And so transactional companies do very, very well. Uh, there's no doubts about that customer uh, commodity sellers uh, are quite uh, good. I mean, uh, uh, you take uh, telecom now, which is a commodity. Uh, you take uh, petrol, which is a commodity. I mean, the companies do well. Uh, you take oil, 
you take uh, obviously there are far, far more complex reasons for some of them to do well uh, including the fact that the product is demand need is in demand but at the same time uh, a lot of people prefer to go to shell petrol right that was i don't know same example i was thinking of absolutely so even in that transactional quadrant there are things that you could do but stay there don't try to go into the personal quadrant at that because it will be too expensive and you won't be able to sustain it if all the customer is looking for is a thing for example uh, let's look at vasudev adigas uh, for bangalore people or uh, say a chain like mcdonalds uh, or, or burger king or dunkin donuts all of them are almost commoditized services but they they thrive where others have failed because they they've strictly they have if you really look at it the drive in ordering their uh, you know to go ordering for year to go all of that and the, and the fast food the quick way in which they deliver is about reducing their contact with you they make you wait the least and the yes i mean uh, they don't have fancy restaurants they don't have fancy stuff uh, you know uh, low lights and uh, the deep cushion chairs none of that right but they survive so transactional quadrant is also a good one personal quadrant i think examples like mckinsey and booz allen and bain and and coaches in hospitals certain some some of the uh, higher end relationships that you have with your cardiologists or your or your surgeons or or your diabetologists or whatever i mean you so those things become uh, relationships there and if they try to commoditize it then it's dangerous for them to for the personal to become transactional is also dangerous so let personal remain personal transactional remain transactional some companies like accenture have tried to bridge the two and have a better way of doing things uh, they they have succeeded to a certain extent but uh, you know uh, and that seems to be a decent enough strategy to adopt in terms of having a layer of personal services and then pushing it to an offshore or where they almost keep the offshore service hidden and treat it as a cost center and have all the work done here on the transactional side it's almost as if they have a transactional relationship and then they uh, the 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 people on site uh, exhibit a personal quadrant relationship with the customer so that the layer that the customer sees is the personal quadrant so things like that also can happen does the dance so, question bharat yeah to an extent yes so i agree to your point that uh, regarding the accenture that uh, you know you're saying that we need to find a bridge between both of the quadrant I, you know at any extent if you go far along uh, especially for the service industry it might have an impact so that's true that's really you know good here yes. okay so ramesh i had a question here like uh, we we these days see a lot of this transformational services now this transformational services when you are engaging into a transformational services you need to do a lot of uh, digging in, below the ground to understand really where exactly because most of the clients would come out and say that we want to transform our business or we want to transform this part of the business now you need to do a lot of digging around to understand really what is that trans what is the their meaning of transformation absolutely now, so there exactly and when you have to do that digging it 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 is not it it is a combination of both personal because they are not going to let you dig unless you develop that personal thing with them and yeah. you cannot dig unless you have that transactional thing with them so <laughs> yeah so the the yeah i understand yes go ahead with your question so so basically in such a situation how do you layer it like you build the personal layer first and then bring in the transactional or you start doing the transactional layer and then show your capability and bring in the personal layer okay <clears throat> see i think it's work both ways uh, first of all i think it's market driven so if you are in a if you are in the market where 
the service you're providing fundamentally uh, the way you've positioned yourself all of that till now has been something that will be viewed by the customer as a transactional service provider uh, then that is what you will be at least for the initial stages uh, whereas for example i will still take uh, accenture as an example uh, anderson consulting and then <clears throat> from there the partners split and rebranded them as accenture but they carried relationships which were in the personal quadrant and therefore and then from there they were able to expand and also grow in india where a lot of the transactional services were being provided so whereas some indian companies have gone from being only transactional offshore low cost providers to becoming uh, strategic service providers uh, even to the extent of uh, having just a single sentence uh, as a requirement and developing it from there and uh, delivering a, a fantastic service so it can happen both ways uh, the personal to transactional expansion is easier yes from a customer perspective from a yes. selling perspective yes but not from an execution perspective especially if cost is a factor uh, you know when you have a personal relationship there there is certain investment that has been already done and that those those are sunk costs etc whereas those costs if you transfer on to a a slightly lower cost those overheads if you transfer on to a lower cost uh, service uh, which is transactional in nature the execution of it becomes difficult uh, so from a customer perspective uh, from a marketing perspective from a sales perspective uh, repositioning perspective personal and then expand transactional is easier but execution is tougher uh, for the people who are in the transactional want to move to personal the rebranding the repositioning is much more difficult but the execution will be easier right Because, I, I, yes. yeah so that's the I, that's I, the trade off yeah i think anderson is a good example because if if you see and if we, if we understand anderson and if we know what we know about anderson they were the bookkeeping guys right they were they were the bookkeeping guys for the business doing the transaction side not Now, yes honestly, but but they were management consultants yeah management consultant but ultimately end of the day they were keeping the books right account they were accounting firm all all of these are five they we have were uh, accounting firms but the partners and the senior consultants there were actually mentors uh, you know trusted advisors to the ceos not just the cfo they were not just a service to the cfo so <clears throat> well i mean the advisory position went to that extent that they also cooked the books yeah exactly yeah. so but yes but it was a personal quadrant uh, service okay. okay yeah i got it thank you so Abhi, is there a not there question yeah so we'll we'll go on to the other questions Please. Okay, so one of the first question was: As a proposal manager, I'm mostly unaware of a new customer till the RFP lands in my box. So, some of the practical suggestions I can give you is first: is there is this thing called Google with which you can search for a company and try to get its financials and all of that and also you could you could reach out to your sales person and say hey i don't know much about this company because i'm i'm not getting in much from google or yahoo finance um, uh, and places like that what is it that i can know and where are we getting involved which aspect of the business are we going to improve obviously a lot of you because you're now verticalized and you all have insights to businesses Uh, once you read the introduction to the RFP itself, you will know quite a bit of why you're there and whether that's that's something that you can deliver. Uh, but that's the question I will ask. See, because 
as as a, a service provider you do only three things and uh, for a customer you either increase his capacity or increase his capability or help him comply with the law just these three things is what you do so given that if you can identify which part of it if you're increasing his capabilities then most probably it will have some amount of personal quadrant relationship aspects but if you're just improving his capacity it mostly will fall under the transactional uh, segment uh, compliance is something that can fall in either of them but predominantly the way the product the the contract will be structured and the services that you do will be structured will be that you will fall more in the transactional service uh, transactional quadrant rather than in the personal quadrant does that help you yeah i think yes sir. okay and the second is how do you describe a dream sales support a bit team with them with whom you would be happy to share your sales bonus uh, <clears throat> most sales guys look for a team which will uh, which will engage with them early uh, two or three things who will respond fast who will engage early and be take it uh, seriously and the third is who will push the delivery teams to give the lowest effort mix so those i mean i've spent so much time on the road with sales guys that if you can do i mean for example if you just drop in a line uh, to the guy every day saying this is the status of the pro uh, of the proposal Uh, that is that itself is uh, uh, gold in terms of uh, how they view a sales person now how they do a thing second is obviously people who can present that in a much better way uh, what i mean by that is that a lot of us in the pre sales uh, sections we tend to focus too much on what the service is right what it is you know this is a java architecture with radian framework with j2e and whatever and with the uh, no db sql no sql db and i know we we go on the architecture we go on the features so much but we don't actually focus enough on what that does for the customer right. so if you can move from features to actually discriminators and advantages or just discriminators and what the customer can do with it you know why 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 should you have a transition plan which is front loaded for instance uh so can you make that so rather than saying you know transition plan will have front loading in instead of that if you can say the customer will reduce risks of flight of knowledge through our early loading of transition person the 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 message that you are giving is completely different because sales also wants those kind of messages to surface rather than being hidden somewhere think team statements and communicate using team statements that itself uh, will help you become a, a dream uh, team support team for the sales people what are the capabilities you as a sales professional expect in your bid manager uh, uh pro basically program management stakeholder management uh keeping it tight uh giving me early warnings and telling me clearly what i am supposed to do because remember that i i as a sales guy is probably handling different relationships at different levels and different deals at different points in at the same point in time different deals at different stages and therefore if i can get a prod from somebody saying hey boss for this deal you need to do this this and this and track me help me track that 
that itself can be a huge help. So you're program managing not just the bit, but also me. Okay. The fourth question is about how do I help my sales team to chase the right opportunities? Now, given this quadrant, and you can yourself figure out, and obviously this requires a conversation with some seniors, in terms of what kind of relationships you want. I mean, do you want something that looks very similar to biotyranny? Or do you want something that looks similar to, looks like personal? So what would you want? So that, that is how you chase uh, the right opportunities and you try to push that. Okay, how do you negotiate with customers who initially make tall claims on quality and during negotiation make cost as the ultimate deciding factor? Now, that's a three-day course. Or, uh, and by the way, I'm, my next book is on negotiation. I've just started my research on it uh, and interviews. So let's see where that goes. But, but you know, uh, I, I do remember once uh, somebody was asking me for a zero quality, zero error uh, delivery or something of that sort. So I told him, yeah, we can do that. But then your productivity per function point, you know, instead of being about 17, 18 days per uh, man days per function point, would be some 35 man years, which is the NASA standard. So, you know, Quality, cost, and time are three dimensions. And sensible customers accept it. Yes, there will be one or two which are playing the bad cop saying no, 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 and all that. But I think it's up to you to kind of negotiate that out uh, by being very, very open about it. Saying, look, mistakes, this is the process capability we have. This is how we're supposed to do it. Of course, you determine which quadrant. Most probably these guys are in the bioterrain quadrant. And, and somebody has pushed them in to, to do that. See if you can bring them down to the transactional quadrant. Huh. How do you identify clients who have pre-decided on a solution? Now, this happens and uh, you know basically they're scouting for new ideas by floating an RFP. Uh, in my experience, when we do two, two RFPs or three responses, and we find that the customer is not taken decision, then stop bidding. This has, uh, this has nothing to do with the book actually. It's just, uh, why do you want to spend money in that? Who should be responsible for making and implementing the deal win strategy and equally take responsibility of the win or loss of the deal? Sales. What would you suggest to win an RFP opportunity having no customer relationship and not being the lowest priced? Uh, don't get into it. Uh, absolutely, disqualify them. Because remember this, the kind of customers you choose determine the kind of growth that you'll have and the kind of, the, the biggest factor in a business's success is the kind of customers they get. A lot of people forget that. We talk a lot about strategy. We talk a lot about positioning, branding, this, that, nothing. First, the most important factor is how good are your customers uh, and where do they take you? If you have, if I have to move to a sales role after spending five years plus as a proposal manager, what skills do I need to develop? Uh, there is a book called uh, To Sell is Human by Daniel Pink. I think that's the first thing that you need to read uh, to understand that everyone is in a sales role and that there are three big factors uh, that help you in uh, the, the book talks about ABC, which is earlier always be closing, but now it is, uh, you know, attitude buoyancy uh, and uh, credibility. So the, Daniel Pink talks about it beautifully. See how you can develop those. Obviously you need to be prepared for a lot of rejections. 
you have to be mentally strong uh you need to when you get into the car to drive to your office you need to leave your ego behind particularly when you're meeting customers uh you should be able to uh, isolate rejections as temporary and not directed against you so there's a lot of mental stuff that you need to be good at to to succeed, to be happy in the sales role others will be miserable especially if you're been in project management you're used to gantt charts and figuring out who is on leave and who's on training and uh, you know and which is the critical path and stuff like that suddenly to go from that kind of a reasonably stable environment to this chaotic thing where your custom you know your prospects can come behave in any which way they want to they have absolute freedom to do that and still being responsible for some numbers that you need to make out of them uh, the, the the pressure the this the mental the resilience that is needed is far far greater so that is what i would focus on rather than because anybody can teach you how to do power messaging how to uh, what is the sales method that they use they may be using miller hyman they may be using solution selling they may be using power messaging revenue storm you know it multiple people so all of them talk about how clearly you develop relationships and how how you message them and how you approach and how you close and all of that so that is the hard skill that you can learn and in through the experience uh, over a period of time but the biggest thing there sales is 99% mental resilience once you get that i think that will be easier for you uh, do companies hire sales professionals without market leads or connections uh, you can't call somebody a sales professional if he doesn't have connections or market leads so i think the, the question itself is uh, not the you know the question itself has the in, inherent contra- contradiction there so if he's a sales professional he has to have connections he has to have some amount of market leads otherwise you don't hire which is the most difficult thing selling products or services oh selling anything is difficult uh whether it's i mean if you can think of a product that everybody wants at a very low cost you've been able to build it and you can price it low and you know all the dream things are there then yes product selling is better but that doesn't happen does it so selling anything is difficult uh, it requires resilience it requires fortitude it requires patience it requires humility uh, it requires curiosity and learning and it requires what is called a growth mindset There's a beautiful book mindset i forget the name of the author that's another book that you could read in fact i bought it and gave it to my son to read so that's a wonderful book uh, for having this growth mindset and once you have that then you will understand that selling is the same regardless of what you're selling and there is one more final question that was there what should be the bid strategy for startups considering them as first timers without any prior experience and client references uh if there is a qualification criteria uh if there is a qualification criteria uh, which eliminates you then don't bid don't waste your time approach customers who are more open there will be a set of customers who don't who cannot pay that much who don't want the big guys because for the big guys the customer will be too little so reach out to those kind of customers and try to sell to them be open about it saying boss i don't have a customer you will be my first and therefore if there's something can we do it outcome based can we can we have part of the fees as outcome based so stuff like that and give them uh, you know demos and uh, stuff like that to assure that they do it it's it's not easy i mean i'm just saying it in 2 minutes less than 2 minutes but that it will take you 3 to 5 months to get that done it is tough uh, selling as a startup is especially uh, in a market which is crowded will be tough but then i would always ask you 
why are you in a startup uh, why are you a startup in a market that is crowded why aren't you in a niche if you are in a, in a niche obviously these kind of questions will not come up so those are the questions that i had i hope i have answered all of them any other questions i'd be happy to answer and you can connect with me on linkedin uh, and uh, my twitter handle is leaders and will hello yeah yeah hi ramesh uh, this is amir and uh, i'm working with a company called tata consulting engineer predominantly working in the engineering consulting domain it's not a question it's a very practical uh, you know live example which i would like to share with you and understand where i stand and how can i get into get, get out from this trap hmm. i am uh, you know dealing with a oil major in mumbai uh, from the past 4 years and it this relationship has been developed from a very top post level hmm. uh, from both the organization side okay and we did lots of uh, you know uh, exchange of information workshops had happened uh, you know uh, meetings had happened We we even signed a MOU last uh, last year, but nothing is coming out. You know, we don't know where they are. I mean, where they wanted to test it. Everything is fine. We signed the MOU as well. Mm. So you know, that actual transaction between a seller and buyer is not coming out. Yeah. And we don't know where to what to you know where we are going right now. So I just wanted to understand in this certain in this certain situation. Where do I stand in your quadrant system? Ah, uh, I think uh, first, I, I think uh, indeterminate would be the answer right now because they've just signed an MOU, right? Right. right. Uh, so right now I can't really make any uh, things, but clearly uh, something has happened after the signing of the MOU that they're not engaging with you. Uh, it could be as simple as you not taking the steps. now that you've done the mou what steps have you suggested to them see uh, mou has been signed after you know a deep drive of uh, you know they evaluated our competencies and capabilities on certain topics yep and, and they have covered those topics in the they, uh, the mou which has been signed uh, and uh, they wanted to do us a business with us but i mean We we have not got any single RFP from them on those any of the ten uh, topics. Yeah. See, once you have an MOU, what is stopping you? It gives you access to people at least sourcing, and then to some business people. Have you put an engagement manager there? What have you done to go and say, okay, here are the products, guys. We've, you know, Mr. Oil Major, these are the things that you are facing right now. and these are the solutions we have for that and if you use our solution you will get this benefit how many such pitches have been made to them see we we have tried to present our case studies where we have you know actually did a lots of work but somehow i mean uh, i mean we are uh, you know losing the ground step by step and it's become a very questionable to from our management what is going on yeah so, uh, so i think uh, if the relationship is at the top level so i think uh, your top guy has to meet uh, talk to that top guy and say guys we've signed this deal we've spent both of us have spent a lot uh, a lot of effort in getting this mou out of the way and so we can service you and you can service us so what's stopping uh, is there anything that uh, we are not doing that is stopping you from giving us more business because we want your business so i i think that kind of a frank uh, chat needs to happen and it cannot happen at your level uh, yeah i mean very honest yeah yeah, yeah really. it has to be at that uh, ceo cxo levels i'm assuming you're not cxo or ceo no, because no. your voice <laughs> sounds your voice sounds fairly young yeah yeah i'm very young <laughs> <laughs> so thank you ramesh i got the message yeah. <clears throat> so any more questions guys uh, i think we have we have quite a lot and uh, ramesh is a early riser so he needs to go to bed i think <laughs> no no i still have an hour to go to bed <laughs> no worries 
Before yeah. 10, if I go, I'm happy. <laughs> okay. So, any more questions we have or we can share, uh, you can share the questions uh, with me and we can again have, we can, uh, I can just uh, have a chat with uh, Ramesh and we can see. But anyway, overall, uh, I think Ramesh, uh, this, these are uh, certain things uh, which uh, really are from the ground, from the trenches, not from the ground. These are things uh, which we need to, which we learn really by getting into the trenches and uh, sharing them with this community, I think has been very helpful. So on behalf of the community, I really thank you. Uh, thank you for that. And I think uh, uh, any any parting uh, advice you would like to give to this community. This community is a uh, is a mix of all sort of uh, people. People so with I, three years experience. So I've mentioned two books. One is Mindset by Carol Dweck. I've just oh I've sent it to me. Yeah, she so is that a Stanford a Stanford uh, professor, right? Yes. So I'm sorry. I sent it only to Nilesh uh, privately. So I'll send it to everyone. Mindset by Carol Dweck. Yeah. And uh, and the other one is To Sell is Human by Dan Pink. So yeah. if you guys can read those two books. They are very, very good books to read. And that's one thing. Try to get into a reading habit. Uh, I, I hope at least this, this uh, pandemic and the ensuing uh, confinement uh, gets some books at least uh, that you could read uh, so that, you know, because the, the reading is the only way you become more interesting. Uh, exactly. The more knowledge you have, the more, the more you input into yourself and the more varied your reading is. I mean, don't just uh, limit it to nonfiction uh, or only management books or only Java books or only that. Also look at uh, fiction, uh, good, great fiction writers. Go to Project Gutenberg. They have some of the best fiction writers of the early years, including Agatha, Agatha Christie and Scott Fitzgerald uh, out there, great poets. So read some of that. Uh, read Oscar Wilde. I mean, his his little play called uh, The Importance of Being Earnest is, uh, I mean, it's it, it's just so humorous. So stuff like that. Read variedly. Uh, read the Gita. Read uh, read the Bible. Whatever. The, bring in multiple aspects so that you you these things inform you, and you're able to. First of all, you know everybody talks about connecting the dots. Before you connect the dots, you need to collect them. So that is what reading helps you do. Because it's about others' experiences being distilled. If you can read widely and well, that would be one of the disciplines that you need that, that can really help you in your career, regardless of which, where, which way you're going, into sales or into delivery or into research, or even getting back to call academics, becoming a professor, whatever you want to do. Uh, this this will hold you in good stead. I think that was a very wise insight shared by an experienced uh, leader like you from the industry. So thank you very much, uh, Ramesh. Abhijit, thank you so yeah. much for having me. I I hope I did a decent job. Uh, I've yeah, got yeah. a lot of messages. Uh, thank you so much. Very kind messages. Thank you for that. And. Please connect with me on LinkedIn or, you know, you can follow me on Leaders Annual uh, on the Twitter handle. I occasionally tweet. I don't tweet much, but I do tweet uh, uh, very, very, this thing. I have two Twitter handles. Leader Anvil is the professional one. And I'm trying to keep Leaders Anvil as the professional one and Ramesh Doreraj as the personal one. So you can follow me on Leaders Anvil for my professional network. Uh, that's... That's what it is about. So I'd welcome you to link, link up with me. And Nilesh, thank you so much uh, for thanking me on that. Thank you, everyone, for participating in today's event. Uh, our next uh, event is on Saturday, where we have, a, as Ravi said, something based on fiction. It's a like a management lessons from the money hist. So that's going oh, to be a, yeah. So that's a, so Ramesh, I can send you an invite. It's by yeah, one of our... Actually, Money Heist is on my watch list. I'm oh, right okay. watching Star Trek. 
Okay, so it's a it's a there's some uh, management lessons from uh, for bid managers from Money Hist. Oh, so, wonderful! Uh, that's going to be quite interesting one. So 8 p.m. Saturday. See you. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Awesome. Bye. Bye.